Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Why don't I have those exciting special things? I think that many times we let what should be extremely special to us become too commonplace. Several years ago, three, four, five, something like that, I was kind of prayer murmuring to the Lord. You know what I mean by that? It's like praying but kind of murmuring. And I said, Lord, why don't I have those exciting, special things happen in my life with me and you like I used to when I first started to know you? And I'll never forget what the Lord spoke to my heart so clearly. He said, Joyce, I still do the same things all the time. It's just that you've gotten used to it. I can remember when I would open my Bible and see a scripture that was just a word for me for that day, and I would just about go wild. You know, God speaks to me all the time now, led by the Spirit, hear His voice, have His presence. And yet I had the audacity to say to God, why aren't you doing anything <laughs> in my life? And I feel like tonight is going to be very, very good for all of us. Of course, I've studied this, and I'm really excited about it. I've been waiting really for months to bring you this word. But I hope that this has an impact on your life tonight that will make some very permanent changes. Because you see, I believe that if we will live amazed, that we'll never be without hope. And the more hope we have, the more hope we can give to other people. And I want to tell you that we live in a society where people are desperate for hope. And we're about the only light that they're seeing. The world is getting darker and darker, but the Bible teaches us that in the midst of that, we should get brighter and brighter. So we need to turn the lights on. We need to shake things up a little bit tonight. We need to realize what we have and learn to live amazed. I mean jaw-dropping, wide-eyed. That was God. Come on, somebody give him praise. It sounds kind of ridiculous to say that we've gotten used to God. But we have so much available to us. Oh my gosh. You can have, I don't know, how many Bibles? I, I mean, I probably have 50, 75 Bibles. CDs, DVDs, stacks of every kind of music that you can imagine. You can sit and flip through preacher after preacher on TV, complain about all the ones you don't like and don't agree with. <laughs> There's churches on every corner, radio, iPods, iPads, <laughs> Facebook. I mean, we're just drowning in the Word, and yet our world is in deeper trouble <laughs> than what it's ever been in before. We spend more on, entertain on, on entertainment than any generation ever, and yet as a whole, and that's not all of us, but as a whole, people are more miserable than ever. So kind of seems to me like something that people are doing out in the world isn't working. And I know that God is in the midst of all this just thinking if you'd just pay attention. Can I tell you something? God works in all of our lives a lot more than what we realize that He does. There's no telling how many times when you're driving in traffic that God saves you from a disastrous accident. There's no telling how many times in a year God saves each one of our lives. We have His angels with us. We have the power of the Holy Spirit leading us 
and guiding us. How many times do you just kind of know that thing that you need to know about your kids and they don't know how you know, but you know, and you don't know how you know, but you know. That's something special. And we need to be amazed. We need to live amazed. And the more amazed we are, the happier we are, the more hopeful we are, the more joyful we are, and the more we can start a pandemic of hope out in the world. Somebody said to me, what is a pandemic? I said, it's a level up from an epidemic. In 1918, 50 million people died from the influenza, and they called it a pandemic. And when we're finished here tonight, I hope to send you out with an attitude, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to start a pandemic of hope. And let me tell you something, if you can't handle a pandemic, then at least go home and start an epidemic. <laughs> the more we're amazed about God, the more other people will be amazed. I want to start by talking to you about the Ark of the Covenant. You know, the Ark was extremely important to the Israelites. It was designed by God, overlaid with gold, contained the Ten Commandments. The mercy seat was on the top of it where God's presence manifested. Oh, they revered the ark. It was special. God's presence was special. It was holy. Nobody touched it. It could not be touched by human hands, so it had rings on the side of it and poles had to be inserted through those rings and only certain people were assigned to carry it and it had to be carried on those poles lest anyone touch it. Why? Because God is that holy. You know that God is so holy that if anyone tried to touch God without coming through Jesus Christ, they couldn't stand it. We need to reverence God's presence more. And to be honest, we need to be more reverent in our church services, our, our gatherings. People think nothing of walking out during an altar call. I'll tell you the truth, I go to India and preach. And I, I don't know how they do it, but I have seen those people sit there. Sometimes we'll have like four sessions in one day, teacher after teacher after teacher. And I have seen those people sit there literally for five, six hours on the dirt floor and never even think about getting up and going to the bathroom. <laughs> Americans couldn't do that. We'd have to have three drinks of water, text 15 people, go make a couple of phone calls, run out and get a Starbucks. But see, that's what happens when you have such an abundance of something that you no longer know how to take it for, for uh, you begin to take it for granted. You don't know how to really appreciate it. The Israelites took the ark with them everywhere they went because to them, it was the presence of God. And it always went before them. It never followed them. It always went before them. Well, what do you think the message is? God should always lead and we should always follow. It was carried into battle and went before them. And they followed it, indicating that they were following God. And when they did that and obeyed God, they won every single battle. And if we'll let God go before us, He will fight our battles. When Joshua and the Israelites were ready to cross the Jordan to go into the Promised Land, the appointed priests went before them carrying the ark, the presence of God, and when they put their feet in the water, it parted and the Israelites crossed over. If you want God to part the water for you, just take His presence with you everywhere you go and let it lead. Let it lead. We're not as concerned about disobeying God as we should be. Well, I know God told me not to do that, but. <laughs> well, I know I shouldn't do this, but. 
As the Israelites took God for granted and became too familiar, and the word familiar means common, no longer special, and ordinary. As the Israelites took God for granted, became too familiar with all of his blessings, and they were no longer amazed, their enemies began defeating them, and the Philistines came against them and took the ark. When the priest Eli heard that the ark had been taken, he fell over dead. Now just imagine that. He was so shocked that they were no longer going to have the presence of God and so upset about it that it just killed him. He just fell over dead. When his daughter-in-law, who was pregnant, heard the news about the ark, she bowed over in labor pains and gave birth, and she called her child Ichabod, meaning the glory is gone from Israel. You know, we, we, <laughs> we don't have any time playing church. We need to have God's presence in our midst everywhere that we go. And if that takes a little shouting and a little acting crazy, so be it. I have seen my husband act like a total, complete nut over a football game. <laughs> and my sons. Why should we not act the same way about God? You hath he made alive when you were dead in your sins, not you hath he stiffened. We're born again, not bored again. <laughs> Let's not get too familiar with what should be extremely amazing to us. I told God a few years ago, I said, I want you to move in my life in such a way that I will literally live with my mouth hanging open in awe. And I would have to say when I stand here tonight, <laughs> 27,000 people came to be here with us. And we started with 65. We have the football dome. This event brings in the second highest income into this city in the year. I think we can safely say that a lot of the glory has been gone from the church for far too long. And by the church, I mean the church at large. But perhaps it's because we're no longer amazed at what God does. Perhaps we've lost too much of our reverential fear and awe. And we need to start purposely getting it back and being more reverent and living amazed. I don't like to hear people telling jokes about the Holy Ghost. We, we just need to be careful. God is a holy God. And we need to, we don't need to be afraid of Him, but we do need to have a reverential fear. A reverential fear. You know, I could go on and on. I mean, this, this thing just gets really interesting. The ark was taken to Ashdod after the Philistines got it and placed next to their god, Dagon. <laughs> he was their idol. And the next morning, poor old Dagon had fallen over flat on his face. <laughs> well, they set him back up. And you know, you can keep propping your other gods up all you want to. <laughs> and I say that not for you here, but more for the people that maybe just flipped into the TV program. I said, you can prop your other gods up all you want to, but we have the God of gods, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. Yeah. 
Well, they set him back up, and the next morning he not only had fallen over, but his head and hands had been broken off, and only his trunk was there. <laughs> I think God was saying something. Well, they kept acting silly, so the whole place got full of mice. The people got tumors and boils. So they moved the ark to Goth. They panicked at the deaths that occurred there due to the plague. They got boils and tumors, so they sent the ark to Ekron. <laughs> They had panic, plague, tumors, and boils. So finally, after seven months, they sent it back to Israel. <laughs> we don't know what to do with this God. You can have him back. <laughs> well, they put him on a cart, pulled him by cows, the ark, put it on a cart, pulled it by cows, and went toward Beth Shemesh. And when the people saw it, they rejoiced. They got so happy. But you know what? They disrespected the ark and they looked inside of it. They touched it and many of them just fell over dead. The ark finally ended up in the house of Abinadab for nearly 100 years. Now what happened during those 100 years? People got used to it. Hey, the ark. Probably when they first moved it into that house, I mean, the people were just thrilled. <laughs> the ark of God is in my house. It's kind of like in the beginning. All my sins are forgiven. God does not remember them anymore. I'm a new creature. I'm the righteousness of God. God's not mad at me. I'm going to heaven. I'm full of the Holy Ghost. And then a few weeks later, oh God, I don't understand why you're not doing anything in my life. If you don't do something, God, I just don't think I can hang in with this any longer. Can I tell you something? If not one thing changed in our lives from now until Jesus came back, we should be enraptured over the fact that we are not going to hell. Can somebody say amen? amen. Now, that ark's sitting there and the people got so used to it, I don't know, maybe they didn't even dust it anymore. Maybe they just had it back in a room and eventually shut the door of the room, didn't pay any attention to it. I'm going to use this as an example. This is a bottle of salad dressing. You say, what has salad dressing got to do with being amazed about God? Well, I think this is what happens in our life. We let God settle to the bottom. <laughs> and that's kind of what the, you know, all the good stuff just settles to the bottom. And you know what I want to do here tonight? I'm going to shake you up. So God is now once again mixed up in everything you do. All your thoughts, all your words, all your entertainment, all your attitudes, everything that you do. Amen? That's really what these things are about. You come, you get all stirred up again, you go home, it's not too long, your problems in the world, the devil's sucking out of you, you gotta go back and get another dose. Let's get to the point where we know how to give that to ourselves without having to go get it somewhere. I don't want you to ever stop coming, but you know what? I want you to be helping other people too. Now you know what'll happen? It won't be long, and this will all separate again. And we're gonna have to shake it up again. Stir it up again. You know, Paul told Timothy, stir yourself up. Timothy had gotten fearful and saw what was happening, all the persecution of the apostles, and, and he'd gotten fearful. Maybe he was wanting to quit the ministry. I don't know. And Paul said, stir up the gift that is within you by remembering... <laughs> by remembering the gift that you have when hands were laid on you by the elders that was imparted to you. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. You know, we talk all the time about forgetting the past, but let me tell you something, there's some things in the past we need to remember. 
And you know what I think we do? I think we forget what we ought to remember and remember what we ought to forget. You know, it's a, I mean, I, I don't want to sit around and think about how my father sexually abused me, but I do want to remember what a mess I was and what God has delivered me from. Dave says all the time, if you've ever heard him speak, that that's the major problem that we have in America is we have forgotten the great and mighty things that God did and how he birthed this nation. He birthed it for a purpose. It was birthed and settled on the Word of God, the Word of God alone, and it is wholly unfit for an immoral people. <laughs> oh my, I'll behave. <laughs> Let's don't let the amazing presence of God settle to the bottom of our lives. Let's just don't let God be kind of settled down here somewhere and boy, we know we're saved and thank God we can pull him out when we have an emergency. <laughs> I get so tired of watching people come and tell me how their lives have fallen apart and how they got all these problems and they were people at one time was walking in victory and invariably time after time after time. They quit spending time in the word. They quit spending time with God. They stop going to church to be with other believers. Here comes problems again. Can I tell you something? Whatever you had to do to get what you got, you got to do the same thing to keep it and maintain it. Amen? Well, David finally had the ark taken from the house of Abinadab and he put it on a new cart and they drove it into the city of David. But they didn't follow the original instructions that the ark had to be borne by the priest by inserting the poles through the rings and that nobody could touch it. <laughs> you cannot put Cod on a cart and drive him around. And some of you could just do really well if you would just scoot over, put God in the driver's seat. And listen to me, learn how to follow the beautiful, simple leading of the Holy Spirit. Our lives are not going to work as long as we're trying to run them. Well, the oxen stumbled, it shook the cart, and a man named Uzzah reached out and touched the ark, and he fell over dead. Now. I don't want you to take what I'm going to say wrong. <laughs> I know we live in the dispensation of grace now and God is so merciful and he just loves us so much. And I mean, that, that's great and wonderful and I wouldn't want to live in any other time, but you know what? <laughs> Might be good for us once in a while if some of us would get slapped upside the head. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about the whole thing with Ananias and Sapphira, but I bet it shook the church up when they lied to the Holy Ghost and they fell over dead. All I know is we're, we're living in times where God is just being so long-suffering that I am amazed. And I think God wants us to love us not because we're afraid of what's going to happen to us if we don't. But he wants us to love him because he is lovely and beautiful and wonderful and amazing. And I want to tell you something. I don't just love God. I am in love with Jesus. He is my everything. Well, Saul died and David became king and decided to bring the ark back to the city of David. And this time he did it right. <laughs> You know, we have enough trouble, sometimes we get around to doing it right, don't we? The people danced and sang and rejoiced before the ark, and David got so excited, he was so amazed, so happy to have the presence of God back, that he stripped down to a loincloth and danced through the streets. His wife said, ridiculous, you are embarrassing, you are ridiculous. Well, I don't know about you, but I've decided to be ridiculous. I've decided to love God ridiculously and be loud about it. Amen? 
The sinners aren't quiet. You know, Paul talked in 2 Peter several different places about how he stirred the people up, stirred their faith up, stirred them up by putting them in remembrance, by causing them to remember. And you know what I think we should do? I think it would be healthy if every day we took five minutes and had a think session where you just sat down and thought about something that God has done for you. And, and let's just be childish and just sit in our chair and go, God, I am amazed. Amazed. You know, it's really important for all of us that we stay full of hope. And one of the ways that we can do that is to stir ourselves up every day by reminding ourselves about all that God has done for us. We need to live amazed at the goodness of God. You know, God's creative handiwork is all around us and all we need to do is look at it and think about it with awe and wonder. Unfortunately, in a lot of our communities around here in South Africa and this region in KwaZulu-Natal, um, the abuse, the sexual abuse, uh, the physical abuse of as well uh, is quite horrendous. Even in the area, we were scared for the kids. It's heartbreaking when they're missing. I'm not going to let that happen. That's why I'm fighting for this area. Some of the children in this area mm -hmm. have disappeared? Yes. They did. What we did never you... found them. Before we open up this crutch, they are safe, healthy, good. They are good. So these early childhood development centers are not uh, little nice to haves or nursery places where they keep kids, you know, have fun and play games. They do all of those things, but this is actually investing in long term benefit. This really is something that we can install into a community that opens up the door of the community for us to share the gospel and really stands as a witness, as a shining light into the community about the love of Christ. And we have such great opportunities through our classrooms of hope to help little guys like this who are going to make a big impact on the world one day. With your missions gift right now, you can provide safe, classroom learning opportunities for young children. You and your special gift today will change lives.